here before the primary, we figured out it was probably almost a year ago. It was either in February or March of a year ago, and at that point, I knew about this much about property rights because I was so new to it. And I think at that point, I just told you about the Coalition for Property Rights at that point. And uh, boy, have I been on a crash course for learning ever since. Because there's a lot of issues out there, and uh, I want to tell you about one of them today. Uh, by way of review, though, uh, at, your, uh, at your place, you should have a brochure that uh, will tell you about the Coalition for Property Rights. And uh, I'm not going to take the time to, to walk you through that, but we are a movement of property rights advocates. And what we want to do, our mission is to both promote and protect private property rights. And we do that, you can remember three words for everything about the coalition that you need. First word is educate. We try to educate people as to what private property rights are and how they're being dismantled today. And uh, we do that through luncheons. We do that through our website, which is proprights.com. Um, hopefully, we'll all learn something today as we interact on this issue. Uh, so education is very important. The second thing, though, that we do is we, um, we try to advocate. We like to get in the trenches and fight for people on the private property rights. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the case that's been going on in the city of Orlando regarding front yard gardens. Has anyone heard about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were, we were, I spent some time uh, with that couple and down at City Hall advocating and their, uh, you know, for their right to use their front yard the way that they want to. It's their land. So that whole issue is now being reviewed by the planners uh, of the city of Orlando. And I think I men maybe mentioned last time I was here about a bill that was in the legislature to reform septic system uh, usage and stuff, which I know is a big issue in this area and uh, spent a lot of time in Tallahassee. So we, we actually try to advocate for those issues and for those people. In fact, I want to share with you a really exciting thing that happened on Friday in this regards advocacy. And you're, you're the first group I've had a chance to tell this with, so this is very timely. Uh, back in the early 2000s, there was a couple who lived in St. Augustine, and they began to buy uh, some pieces of property next to Flagler College in St. Augustine. They bought four uh, plots of land, seven of them had big old houses on them, and their intent was to buy those eight parcels and then demolish those homes, those old houses. They were being used as room rentals for students. Uh, they wanted to demolish all that, and then they had this beautiful structure they wanted to put up, uh, which was going to be a very nice boutique bed and breakfast type, type of a hotel. And it was going to look like the architecture of uh, downtown St. Augustine and Flagler College. But when they went, they had to get approval from a committee that was the historical committee. Well, when they went to do that, the committee told them, no, you can't demolish these homes. These are of historic value. <coughs> now, they weren't on anybody's list as having historic value, but they were very old. They were, in fact, pretty dilapidated places. They were beyond repair. So uh, this couple offered to move the homes, which is what a lot of people do. The city wouldn't let them do the moving either. And they, they jumped through hoop after hoop after hoop, trying to get permission to demolish the homes or move them so that they could then build their hotel. And uh, every time they were told no. Now over this period there were 161 such requests. And there were only seven denials and that was the seven properties on which they had these homes. So uh, there was a law that CPR has worked for. It's called the Burt J. Harris Act. that basically says that if uh, you are a private property owner and you want to develop your property and a, and a government says to you, you can't do that, and they begin to what they call inordinately burden your property so that you can't use it and have it achieve its economic expectation, then you have the right to sue and that, that government uh, owes you compensation because it's, it's basically, it's like a regulatory taking is what it is. And so they filed this Burt Harris claim and um, they, um, they went to court uh, they went before the judge, the presentation was made, and the judge in the circuit court, and this was up in, uh, this was in St. Augustine, the judge dismissed the case, said, we're not even going to hear this. So the, the Wendlers, that's their name, the Wendlers appealed the case and went to the 5th District Court of Appeals. I think it happened about a 
month ago, and Friday the court issued their ruling that said it was reversing the decision of the circuit court, and uh, so it breathes life into this issue. And now the Wonders are going to get to go back to St. Augustine and bring their case before a judge, and they have all the facts on their side. So this, we expect that this judge will approve this case and it will go um, to a to a court where there'll be a trial and a jury will make a decision. And all, again, all the facts are on the record. So this is just a huge area. If, if this had not been, if this uh, case had been allowed to be dismissed outright and stayed that way, it would have sent a signal to every property owner in the state of Florida, don't even bother with bringing a Burt Harris Act claim because you can't win it. So this is really great news, and I don't even know if it's in the press yet, but uh, we just heard about that. So that's a good ad, uh, and, uh, that's a good objective of how valuable it is, how important it is to, to advocate for people's rights. So educate, advocate, and then the third thing is to activate. And when I say activate, uh, we try to train people to be property rights advocates in their own have a, We have a, a seminar that's a two-hour seminar called the Effective Advocate. And we try to equip people to develop their own strategies to protect their own rights. You can actually apply the strategies to any issue. It doesn't have to be a property issue, but you can do that. But what I'd like to do today is to share a, a property issue that's a, that's a pretty big one. It's an international property. How many of you have heard of Agenda 21? All right. Some have and some haven't. Okay, well, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll do a quick review of it, but I, I, I will tell you today why uh, this whole issue is so important to us and property rights and should be important to you as well because it really goes back to uh, private property rights. Um, for those who may not be aware, Agenda 21 is effectively the comprehensive plan for the whole world. It's a um, it's a 40, uh, about a three or four hundred page document. Actually, I was doing an interview about a year and a half ago. It was December of 2011. I didn't know much about, I didn't know anything about property rights other than what we did. And um, I remember at the end of the interview, uh, the woman doing the interview said to me, well, you must be a big opponent of Agenda 21. And I said, well, what's Agenda 21? I didn't even know what it was. She said, well, it's only the biggest private property rights issue in the world. And I thought, gee, and I don't even know about it. So. So anyway, I went online and I began to find all these websites regarding Agenda 21. And I was pretty shocked by what I saw. And I, I, I felt that sometimes a lot of hyperbole was used to state the cases. I wasn't sure if all the facts lined up. And so I, I did what any of you would have done. I went to the United Nations website and I found Agenda 21 and I downloaded uh, Agenda 21. And I had no idea it was going to be three to four hundred pages. I mean, it, it's a huge document, 40 chapters, and it's, it's, uh, it tells everything about how the world should operate going into the future. That's why they call it a, a new global partnership for sustainable development, and it's built around the sustainable development. This document was officially released to the world in 1992 at a thing called the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. So that was a big global conference they did, and you've heard about that. The key words are sustainable development, and that means meeting today's needs without compromising future generations to meet their, uh, their needs. You know, who could argue with that? That sounds pretty fair. But there's some things you need to know about it. To do that, there are three things that need to be sustained. One is the environment, and there's a lot in Agenda 21 about that. The economy needs to be sustained. And then this thing is called equity. That's not property equity. That's more social equity. And we've heard a lot about that in the last five years. So it's about fairness and uh, bringing everybody into the, into the group and treating them fairly. And, and we'll, you'll hear more about that later. Now, in Agenda 21, here, here's what caught my attention right away. In the preface to Agenda 21, there's a statement that says, if this plan is going to succeed globally, uh, it will require a substantial flow of new and additional resources to developing countries. Now, you can put two and two together and say, well, that means where does it have to come from? It has to come from developed countries, of which we are pretty close to the top of the heap, if not up there. And what they really want to do by this huge global transfer of wealth is to eradicate things like poverty and hunger and illiteracy and ill health, things like that problems that have always been here and probably always will be. 
I began to do research on this, after, and I, I took Agenda 21 up to legislative session, and I read every page of it, and I was pretty shocked by what I saw. But I found this quote, and this came from actually um, a predecessor conference that was held in Vancouver a number of years ago. And this is why I got interested in Agenda 21. Because those of you that know Agenda 21, it involves health care, it involves um, economies, it involves energy, it involves education. It just, you point the gun in any direction and you'll hit something regarding Agenda 21. But this was, the, this was what got my attention because I'm interested in property rights. This quote said that land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals, meaning it can't be controlled by you, and it shouldn't be subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market, meaning the free market. So you shouldn't own and control property, and it shouldn't be subject to a free market environment. And if that's not bad enough, it continues on to say that private land ownership how many of you own land? Do we have any land owners here? Okay. Yeah. All right. We're talking about you now. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, uh, and therefore contributes to social injustice. So if you own land here today, you're contributing to social injustice. And if it's unchecked, it becomes an obstacle in the planning and the implementation of development schemes, meaning the implementation and development of Agenda 21. Well, it gets better. <laughs> Public control of land use is therefore indispensable to, the, to its protection as an asset and the achievement of the long-term objectives of human settlement policies and strategies, and that's what Agenda 21 calls for, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But all that to say, so I hope you can, you can see that. I want you to notice that word, indispensable. Mm -hmm. Indispensable. So, in my perspective, there is one thing that stands in the way of what we have now and the fulfillment of Agenda 21, and it's private property ownership and control. So, regarding sustainable development, if this is really going to happen, sustainable development around the world, here in the United States, African continent, or South America, or Europe, or Asia, wherever it is, is going to require a transfer of private property ownership and control to public ownership and control. Public meaning government ownership and control. So that is the, the this is according to Agenda 21. And by the way, every, everything I'm sharing with you today is on our website. Uh, when I read Agenda 21 and, and read this information, uh, I wrote a five page executive summary of it. Because uh, I saw a lot of people talking about Agenda 21 and it, and it and yeah, so it's a, the, the website is on the brochure. All of my contact information is on the brochure, but proprice.com. I wrote an executive summary, and it is fully footnoted from all original sources. It's not my opinion. It's, it, and what I'm sharing to you today is the PowerPoint portion of that executive summary. So any of you could take this off of our website and, and talk to any of your city commissioners or any of your friends. You could do that. So the executive summary is on the website, the, um, the PowerPoint is on the website, and I took the, the executive summary and sort of put it in a speech form. So if you ever you know, want to go somewhere and speak on this topic, it's, it's all right there. All you have to do is read it. Okay. I know you all are going to rush out and do that. <laughs> but anyway, this is what is required for Agenda 21, and it's going to be a destruction of private property moving into government control. Now, this is a thing called the Wildlands Project, and for those of you that don't know about this, this is the way a lot of people envision our future. What you can't see along the perimeter of the United States, and especially up in the Great Lakes, are small black dots that would represent uh, urban centers where people are to live, the cities of the United States. These urban centers are, 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 are called by Agenda 21. They're called human settlements. That's what we live in, or will live in, human settlements. The, the idea of human settlements are, um, they are very dense urban centers, uh, people living in, for the most part, condominiums, high-rise apartments with retail stores on the ground floor. Um, automobiles would be minimal. Uh, the communities are called walkable communities, or a lot of bicycling in these areas. But that's the idea to, to prevent those carbon emissions. Around the urban centers, the human settlements are to be buffer zones. 
And these will be areas where uh, access is very restricted, limited. But then the vast part of our country, which is going to be all of this yellow and red and pink area, this is all to be left as wilderness. And uh, the way they put that, uh, this wilderness, this is where man is the stranger. So it's all to be government owned and highly controlled in that fashion. Now, interesting enough, I spent 14 years of my life working in Moscow, Russia. Um, I, I worked uh, doing some teaching there as um, you know, diplomatic school and uh, doing a missions project. But it, in 14 years of, of living there, I've traveled all over the former Soviet Union. This describes what I observed in Russia. What it's, years? What years? Uh, I was there from 81 to 87. So pretty much I was, I, was, I was on the inside when Ronald Reagan was president for the most part, and then came back for a couple of years and then went back and spent from 90 to 98, which was kind of when communism fell, freedom came, and it was like living in the wild west in those days, I'll tell you that. But anyway, uh, that's what I observed in Moscow. There were the urban centers, highly dense. You know, I lived in Moscow, a city of 16 million people, not one single dwelling home. Everybody lived in apartments, if you can imagine that. And um, you know, the city was really tightly restricted to get in and out of that. You had to clear these police posts. And uh, it, it, was, it was the Wildlands Project. I got to see it. So anyway, I won't take a long time on that. That's where this is destined to go. Now, in Agenda 21, and this is just a brief overview of the various things that Agenda 21 calls for. First, calls for the nations of the world to shape public opinion. Uh, so that everyone will have this Agenda 21 friendly attitude about it. Now, a great example of this, anybody here ever hear of Earth Day? <laughs> that is one of the best PR campaigns ever, and it's everywhere. The world stops for Earth Day. Uh, second thing, they call for the organization of, uh, of, of uh, legal mechanisms and regulatory systems that will write and then enforce Agenda 21 rules and regulations and ordinances, and what could we all testify to that? We have more than that uh, today in our very levels of, of government there. It also calls on the establishment of agencies who would monitor, and, uh, who would monitor this and then enforce compliance. Well, the EPA is the perfect example of that today. That's what they do. They enforce, they monitor, they, they actually create offenses in some cases I've seen. Also calls uh, for uh, the nations of the world to teach all of their personnel, their students, their professors, their administrators, their public uh, of public education, of institutes, of uh, colleges and universities. I was uh, speaking actually to the to the Winter Park Women's Federated Republic about six months ago, and uh, at the end of or at this point, uh, when I got when I sh shared this with the group. Uh, there, there was a young man in the back of the room. He raised his hand. It turns out he was the um, he was the leader of the Young Republican group at Rollins College, and he says that's exactly right. He said we we actually have a PhD at Rollins where you can get a PhD in sustainable development, and it's out there, and it's not just an idea; it's being implemented. Also, the preparation of media and business and industry to accept and promote sustainable development friendly. Attitudes. You know, I, I, there's probably not a piece of mail that you see anymore that doesn't have some little tagline that says, you know, made from recyclable products and stuff like that. Yeah. That's part of the Agenda 21. Now, I'm not, and, and I want to stop a minute and say, you know, not everything in Agenda 21 is is mean and evil and bad. There are some good things about. You know, I would say I'm a conservationist. I think we all want clean water and you know, clean soil and clean air, things like that. But there's something underlying all of this that is a little more sinister, and that's, again, this relieving private owners of their property so it can be controlled by the collective. So, but anyway, the preparation of businesses and industries is out there. Uh, the training and certification of the government administrative uh, planning personnel, management personnel. I'll bet there's not a city or a county administrator and their planning team that has not been through an, a, an Agenda 21, well, it would be called Agenda 21, a sustainable development certification some, some time. And uh, by the way, you may, you may have known about Agenda 21, you just didn't know what to call it. Because you never see that name. It's 
all under this umbrella of sustainable development. Uh, and then it also calls, obviously, to, to elect and, and, and influence Agenda 21 friendly elected officials. Someone has to pass all this stuff. So um, that, that's important. I know you can't probably read all this, but I just want you to see this, this is the uh, table of contents for Agenda 21. And as I said, there are 40 chapters, and it, it just it talks about everything on there. And that, uh, that's on the website. If you want to go back and look at that in more detail, you can do that. I also wanted to point out this. This is a UN report card on the progress of the nations of the world in implementing Agenda 21. And categories, I think there are, and again, I know you can't read this, but I think there are 33 areas here that the UN is tracking to, to determine how the nations of the world are doing with Agenda 21. And the United States, by the way, got a very good report, so, as you might expect. Now, when we talk about sustainable development, the big evil in the world, the thing you'll hear most about is uh, global warming, which, uh, you know, for those who are objective and rational about it, would say, you know, the, 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 there is no such thing as at least man-made global warming, and even they don't want to call it that anymore for the most part. It's been changed to what? Climate, climate change. So there's a lot of words that go on here, but what you don't hear about and see about is the network that's being built around the world to support a lot of these things. For instance, Agenda 21 calls for a governance system of regional councils around the world. And I saw this when I lived in, in Moscow. The, the Soviet Union, the, the Russian Federated Republic, uh, elected their own parliament. Of course, there was only one candidate, but you know, they, elected, they had elections, and they had a beautiful constitution, which no one paid much attention to. But, but they had that as the stage. But then all of the real decision making was, was in a system of councils that met all over Russia. And that was almost more like a Senate kind of a body. So the, the councils made the policy decisions, and then the government, the elected officials, they just implemented what the councils told them to do. The councils were not elected, but they made the policy. And that was in the form of the Communist Party. By the way, do you know, you know what the word um, council means in Russian? The translation of the word council in Russian is the word Soviet. So when you say Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, it's, it, it, that word Soviet was really important. It's, it's, a, it's 15 republics. They all had a socialist focus, and they were run by this Soviet system of councils. And in theory, you know, it was a, a union. It was all, you know, a gunpoint, but Union of Soviet Socialist republics. And you said that they weren't elected. How did they? How did they come? How did they get their position? Uh, they were appointed by the Communist Party. <coughs> yeah, they, these were people that were appointed and counseled together and did that. Also, you know, there's going to be a global transfer of uh, wealth. There's a whole financial network, you know, the World Bank and the uh, International Monetary Fund. That's that's going to be very important. We have to do that. Also, with the transfer of uh, goods and services and things, there's a trade network that's built out called the World Trade Organization. I mean, you, you, we've heard about all of these things, but these are, these are not theories. These are in practice. There's a whole system of jurisprudence that's called the World Court. You know, and if someone violates something, the World Court comes in there and administers some sort of enforcement. I don't even know about this, but there's a whole system that's, that's called the System of Environmental Economic Accounts. Every nation is being tracked, and every nation is being uh, monitored on things like carbon emissions, water pollution, um, land use, and things like that. And they're issued a grade, and, and ultimately they're going to have standards for the nations um, as to how they're doing in these very categories. And if, if they're not complying, there'll be some system of punishment that will be meted out. Now, we don't really wrestle with that today in the United States because we're the big guys on the block and we can pretty much ignore anything at the UN we want to, and we do. But if we were to somehow fall into a place of weakness where the United States could be blackmailed, you know, we would, we would be forced either into compliance or to suffer whatever the, the world courts in the UN wanted to do. So it's just something we need to be aware of.
Okay, and isn't that the framework for cap and tax? Yes. Yeah, cap and tax. That's, that's a perfect thing. Uh -huh. Which again is, is, is a, one of those uh, mechanisms we talked about earlier. It's one of those mechanisms for the transfer of wealth. Because when we exceed our, our uh, emissions, we pay, that money gets redistributed somewhere else. So it's, it's very cleverly defined. This is a beautiful and an awesome plan, by the way. Um, but it's real scary too. Final thing is, under, you know, kind of tying all of this together, it's a whole computerized system of data collection and information gathering and technology so that it's the right people have the right information to do stuff with. So that's, uh, that's, that's what's going on underneath. If you're like me, you might be asking the question, man, if this is so big and it's been going on for more than 20 years, why, why don't I know about it? And uh, I did some research and here's, here's what I found out. One reason we don't know about it is uh, in 1992, our president, George H.W. Bush, actually went to the Earth Summit and he actually signed Agenda 21 uh, as a participant. Now, it wasn't an official treaty from our perspective, and so the, the, this agreement, this global plan, didn't have to come back to the United States where it could be debated or considered by Congress through the advise and consent system. So it was never, and so it just never was a very public uh, thing. But when Bill Clinton was uh, elected uh, to be our president in 1993, through an executive order, he established the President's Council on Sustainability. And that included more than half of his cabinet and then a whole cross section of U.S. leaders and business and industry and people like that, education. And that's when, and you could track it, that's when this whole flood of sustainable development concepts began to just invade our nation. But again, it was done, you know, by the executive order. It wasn't debated, it wasn't even talked about in Congress at all, but we had to live with it. And then a third reason, the implementation of this, is, it, it was, this is not a government program. It wasn't you know, voted on and headlines were made, you know, the U.S. Uh, establishes Agenda 21 policy. Now, the implementation of this goes always through nonprofit organizations called non-government uh, organizations or NGOs. And the most famous one of that is this group called ICLE, the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives. And every word in that title is important because it is you know, this is part of International Agenda 21, and what they do is they try to take the principles of sustainable development and get funding for grants so that they can push the sustainable development agenda, not at the highest levels of government, it's already been there, but at the most local level, and it's their initiative. And so a lot of the standards and a lot of the comprehensive planning stuff, it, it has come out of you know, these local initiatives that have taken, that have taken place. And it, it is, it's a huge, huge organization and they get lots of money. I, uh, I, I noticed that here's, here's kind of how I find out how it all works. We all pay taxes that go to Washington, D.C. Our taxes then get allocated out to the various departments, Department of State, Interior, Defense, whatever the department has, the education, you know, healthcare goes there. I found out that each of those departments, in addition to our just general government giving grants of money to the UN, each of those different departments also send money to the UN in the form of grants. And then the UN, with, with uh, organizations like this, the UN then gives grants to these organizations to carry out the mission of sustainable development. So that might be creating uh, the, the there's one organization, APA, that's the American Planning Association. As I understand it, they were awarded a grant of a million to two million dollars by President Clinton to write a manual on how to write rules and regulations for sustainable development and then get them passed in common. I've seen the manual, I've got chapters of it. You can find it online. So, so that's, that's a typical grant. And then the other grants to do all these studies to say, oh man, the, end of the sky is falling, we're not going to have water here in the, another two years, we've got to do all this other stuff to protect ourselves. So these grants come back. When, um, uh, 
I was looking on their website about a year ago, and they actually had one page, and it was a page of five projects, and President Obama, through the stimulus package, had awarded this one organization $13.2 billion. Okay? That's the kind of huge resources that are out here. So one this is just one organization, $13.2 billion. So that's a lot. Now, there are a lot of members in the U.S. There's something on the order of 550 members. Many of these are city governments, county governments, other organizations. Government entities pay into this membership, and the nations of the world actually pay into this. Um, based on their population. So the more populous you are, the higher your, your fees are. So that's how you, you join that and you get all kinds of benefits. Some of the Florida members um, include the city of Tallahassee, Orlando, Key West, we expect Key West, I guess, right? Uh, Alachua County and uh, Miami-Dade County or some of the counties. Orange County, I think, is a member. Seminole, was a, Seminole County was a member. They, uh, when they heard about this, uh, they withdrew their membership and that's you one of the action points here. I don't know about Lake County. We're not a no, no. Okay. Good. Around the world, there's more than 1,200 members, and so there, it's everywhere. By the way, uh, this other organization here, I just want to point out that this is the American or the U.S. Green Building Code. All of the LEED certification on new modern buildings and stuff, it all comes out of this organization. You ought to go on their website. They are all over the world. It's just a huge, huge organization, but incredible sums of money to spend on this kind of thing. So anyway, that's, that's the third reason why we don't know about it. It's, it wasn't some big uh, attention-getting plan. It's all been done very quietly and at the most local level. Fourth reason, you need to understand there's a whole jargon or language if you're going to understand the whole sustainable development argument or conversation. The uh, jargon sounds Sounds warm and fuzzy, and um, you know, but it's not. Now, this guy right here, um, Gary, uh, Gary Lawrence, J. Gary Lawrence, he was the advisor to President Clinton on the Sustainable Development Council. He was giving a lecture in the UK. This is in, I think, 1997. But he was giving a lecture uh, in, uh, in the UK at a UN conference, and he was speaking to the group on how to elect public officials who would be backers of Local Agenda 21. you got to see this. You know, if I told you this quote, you didn't see it, you wouldn't believe it. But this is just this is how it works. Now he said here, he said, you know, participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many of the conspiracy fixated groups, you know, like us, and the individuals of our society. This is a segment of our society who fear one world government and a UN invasion of the United States to which our individual freedom would be stripped away would actively work to defeat any local official who attempted to, to join the conspiracy by undertaking local agenda 21. So then this, this was the big one. So we call our process something else such as comprehensive planning, growth management, and smart growth. Now I've done a little bit more research since I found this quote, and uh, this could make us think that Agenda 21 is the creator of the terms comprehensive planning, smart growth, and uh, growth management. And to a large extent, they have used that. But I found that some of these ideas actually predate Agenda 21. And you know, there were, there were some pretty good ideas out there because it's, there's nothing wrong with forward thinking and thinking. You know, if we're going to have 30% uh, more people living in our area in 20 years, we need to be thinking through um, how are we going to care for their needs? How, how do they get water? Are we going to be able to supply that and stuff like that? There's nothing wrong with planning and being forward looking. But a lot of these things are used to restrict private property rights and again to move property from the private sector into the public sector. And what they can't move into the public sector, they so restrict that you can't really move the property. So, you know, it's just a different way to take it. That's what that one is what comes down to it. But I just thought that was pretty good. Somebody was smart enough to sort of co-opt some good ideas and now take it in a totally different direction. So we have to be attentive to these things. And these are just some of the warm and fuzzy words that, that are often used in the sustainable development argument. Again, you can go back and, and look at these. 
But next time you read about this in the paper, you hear some of this terminology on the radio, you're going to think, ah, oh, hey, that's about sustainable development. I know about that now. And you're going to start to question it, and that's good. Now, uh, last year was the 20th year of uh, Agenda 21, and they did another conference down in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they're kind of changing the name of Agenda 21 because now that people know about it, they don't know that they like it. So oftentimes it's called the Millennium Project. <laughs> And it calls for a fundamental shift in the way that we think and act. That could come out of the Obama administration there, probably. But anyway, here's how they go about transforming the global economy. On the most local level, they do it through controlling land use and through all the restrictions. And at the nation level, uh, national level, they use it through controlling energy. And isn't that a big deal? I mean, if you can control energy, if you can control electricity, you can stop the world if you want. I mean, look at what happens when we have a hurricane and we're five days without power. You know, we are all going crazy. Can you imagine that if someone just turned that off at will? Or it got so expensive we couldn't afford it. And then at the international level, they use this thing called tech technology diffusion. And what that is, that, that, that is a study of how fast a concept can go through various cultures. You know, various cultures around the world. We, we think in more of a, what I would call a rational and a linear type of, of thinking. That's not the way a lot of people in the world think. So they are, they are constantly studying, how can we take this concept of sustainable development, for instance, and push it through a culture so that that culture understands it and buys into it. So that's the kind of things that are going on in, in, in the stratosphere of all of this. If you're like me, so what do we do about it? Well, here's a couple of things. I wanted to remind you again, remember the quote that we said, public control of land, uh, or, yeah, public control of land use is indispensable for this to happen. And I said that Agenda 21 requires a transfer of land from private property ownership and control into the public, or government property ownership and control. So I, I, you know, I began to, there, there, were, there was a group that wanted to do a bill that said anything in, in Tallahassee, I'm sorry. There was a group that wanted to do a bill, and Alabama actually passed something like this a year or two ago, that said any policy or appropriation that can be traced back to UN Agenda 21 is prohibited. Wonderful. Well, that sounds great. The only problem with that is it's totally unenforceable. I'm not even sure it's constitutional, but there's no way that you can force that. If you wanted to raise that question here in Lake County, and you went to your, your county administrator and said, hey, you know, your water policy is Agenda 21. Uh, they would say, well, prove it to me. And where would you be? How would you be able to do that? And uh, you could go out and hire an attorney if you thought you had a way to do that. But what are the chances of you having enough money to pay an attorney to stay in the game long enough to, to buy a city or a county on this? So, so I thought, no, what we need to do, we need to be thinking the way the sustainable development People. You know, they've got a 20 year head start. We can't just wipe it out in one bill. I wish that we could, but I ran that bill by a number of legislators and they wouldn't even touch the topic of Agenda 21. It just became so toxic. <laughs> so I thought, okay, so after talking, I thought, you know, what if we had a way to, to slow down or to balance out this transfer of land from uh, private ownership to government ownership? And so we came out with Bill and it's called the Land Purchase by Government Entity Act. And here's what the bill does. It's sponsored by your senator, Senator Hayes, and a man named Charlie Stone, who is from Ocala. He's the House member who's sponsoring this. And it basically says this. Um, these, are, these are four things that a government must do before they can buy more land to put into conservation. Because this is really how it happens. Land is bought for conservation, and we can't get to it. Think of Alaska. The tremendous resources that are there, and we can't even get to it because it's owned by the government, even though we the people are the government, we can't get to it. So they buy the land and put it into conservation. What is not purchased into conservation is so restricted, you can't use it. I was, in fact, I was at a, a symposium in uh, Gainesville a year, a year and a half ago, and there was a man, you know, Florida Forever Program is, that's the entity that buys the land and puts it into conservation. A man from Alachua County got up at the symposium and he told a story of how they had funding and they were buying up all this land in Alachua County for conservation. And then he said, but something happened, the economy tanked and all of a sudden the money all dried up. 
and he looked sad. And then he smiled and he said, but you know what we did? We just started going around our county and identifying parcels of land, and we would come in and just wave the wand and declare them to be conservation easements. And so, you know, if you have a conservation easement, don't even try to cut the grass there. You can go to jail for that. So if you can, you can either sell your land or you, know, you can have these easements and, and you just can't use it. So that's what happens. So anyway, again, we're not anti-conservationists here. So we're just saying let's be good stewards of the land and the money. So the four things. If you're going to buy more land, then show that you have a current and accurate inventory so that you, you know what land you have. Nothing wrong with that. Second thing, you know, show you have the money in your budget to maintain those properties. All that land has to be maintained by somebody. Well, hopefully it is. So you have the funding to maintain it. Third, you know, I'd like you to do an analysis on the proposed purchase to say, you know, what is it going to cost us into the future to maintain this land? I'm friends with a, a commissioner in the, the city of Winter Springs, and 10 years ago, they got a, a government grant. I'm convinced it's a, it's a, it was a sustainable development grant of several hundred thousand dollars to plant trees all over their city. So they've had this beautiful canopy effect in their city. Now they can't afford, they, you know, no one thought 10, 15 years later, we got to maintain all these trees and keep them, you know, from knocking out the electrical wires and things like that. And they don't have the money to do the maintenance. So we're just saying, let's think forward here a little bit. How much is it going to cost us? I mean, you would do that. Uh, before you would jump in and buy something, you would say, can I afford this? That's all we're saying. And then the fourth thing, and this is probably the more controversial one, and this will be up, all of these points will be up for discussion, but here's the principle. If we're going to keep land in private ownership and control where it really is best used, let's do this then. For every acre that's published from the private sector by government, we'd like government to sell back to the private sector one of those acres so that we maintain this balance of always having more ownership in the private sector than out there in the public sector, and constantly building this up. Now there's going to be some variations on some of these things, and hopefully it's going to be debated. Maybe it'll even be in one of the committees this week we haven't heard yet. But, but that's the idea of this bill, is to um, just say, hey, before you go out and buy more conservation property, let's be good stewards of the land that we have. Let's, uh, you know, let's, let's be good stewards of the money that we have. That's just this fiscal responsibility. And let's have this happen. You know, land is always, I, I will not say always, almost always best used and maintained when it's in private hands. And when an acre is transferred from the private sector to the public sector, several things happen. Number one is that land generates no, no tax revenue for a county. Uh, a second thing that happens is that land is totally taken out of productive ability. It, it makes no contribution to the whole uh, economic development of our state. Uh, another thing is now, instead of producing revenue, it actually costs the state money because now you've got to maintain it. So those are, you know, when we buy a, a more and more land, we hurt ourselves in a lot of different ways, and we just need to be careful with that. So anyway, that's a, it's Senate Bill number uh, 584, and House Bill, the House Bill is, um, 901 had to do this before we had the, the bill number. Here's some things that you can do if you want to get involved uh, literally today. Uh, first, we want to help you in the following ways. Number one, um, you can send an email to your senator and your representative and ask them to co-sponsor these bills. Every one of you has a senator and a, and a representative. Uh, I would counsel you do not send out blast emails to people who are not your senator and representative because I've seen, I, I worked in Tallahassee for you know, both in the House and the Senate, and if you're not a constituent, if they can start getting emails from non-constituents, uh, they oftentimes just delete that stuff. But if you're a vote, that's a big deal, and you have that right, and those, those people work for you, so you could call say, hey, would you... Uh, would you uh, sponsor, if you're a senator, sponsor 584, if you're a House member, 901. That would be one thing. Um, also, I'm going to do one thing here. If you would like to be a part of this, um, <clears throat> I've been speaking all over the state on this, and I have a distribution list where every time action is ready to be taken on the bill, 
um, I sent out an email thing to let people know who who are on the committees, uh, what you can do, how to say it, and if you'd like to be getting those emails, I'm going to give you a chance today to sign up. There's a there's a list there, and let me hand out those pass those back, please. I just need your name and your email, and just write it so I can read it. Okay, that would be helpful. But but um, you know when these bills come up for a committee. I'll send out the next email that will say, this, uh, this particular committee is going to hear this bill in this state. Here are the people. Uh, if, and, and if, if you have a representative or a senator that's on that committee, that's very important to say, we're for that bill. Because I'll tell you, the cities and the county association stuff, they don't, they don't like this bill. And, and we need to let our friends know that uh, we're for it. And then I know a number of you probably have your own email distribution list, so once you get this, pass it on to other people so that they can do the same thing, okay? And I actually try to script it. In fact, for those who sign up today, when I get back today, I'll send out the first alert that I sent out last week. And it basically tells you what to say to people. I mean, what to say to a senator or to a representative, how to write to them. You can cut and paste it if you want, or you can, you know, you can make it your own. Um, just a couple things here in closing. Thomas Jefferson said this, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And I don't know about you, but I remember right after the election in January and in February, I spoke to a number of 9-12 groups, Tea Party groups, and some of those places I went. People were just tired. It was discouraging not to have won that election, and, and people worked so hard, and, and now it's like, we're going back to ground zero. Well, not really. But it feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so we need to stay engaged. And Thomas Jefferson, you know, it's hard to be vigilant all the time. It's just hard. Uh, but the enemies are out there, and they're being vigilant, and we have to do that too. And, and he really had that. And then here's a great quote. I use this one all the time. This guy Arthur Lee was a was a colonist in in Virginia back in the 1770s. And in 1775, he said this. He said, "The right of property is the guardian of every other right." To deprive people of this is in fact to deprive them of their liberty. Think about that for a minute. Think of all of the rights that we have. It's the right of property that says you can um, you can feed yourself. It's the right of property that says I've got a place where I can house myself. I've got a place I can retreat to protect myself and my family. If you don't own property, you are dependent on somebody else. If you own property, you at least have options. But if we lose that right, it's just easy to knock down the other dominoes and lose the other right. So it's the right of property. That's the guardian of every other right. And our founding fathers really understood that. Benjamin Franklin said it best. We don't hang together. We will surely hang separately. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. And so that's why it's important for us to unite where we can and to fight these battles together. It doesn't take a lot, but it takes really well-placed um, you know, bolts on a target to be more effective. So uh, again, all of this is on the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And you know, just here's the three keys. You know, I'm all for sustainable liberty, not just sustainable development. So be educated and be equipped and then be engaged. And if we'll do those three E's, you know, we can present a united front and we can win a battle. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Does anybody have any questions for Dan this morning? A couple things. It's an observation I wanted to make as a local elected official. Um, it's really difficult when you're trying to weigh out those things that, for example, you brought up water and our need for water, knowing that uh, I don't think there's any question our springs are under a certain amount of threat and our aquifer and all. And so I think what one of my biggest challenges is recognizing that Agenda 21, there are a lot of things about it that are, that are really bad, you know, the, 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 taking away our sovereign rights and all of that. Um, and the transfer of wealth among nations with us as people in America having no say over it. I mean, we're, we're sending all this money to these countries. We don't know what happens to that money when it goes there. Um, so, but locally, 
you know, we have to make decisions about protecting our area. We don't want Lake County paved over with concrete. We want public spaces um, and conservation lands. We just don't want so many that we can't take care of it or that we our tax roll gets all messed up and we're paying way too much yeah. to private taxes because we got to fund all this public land. So I, my you know, big challenge is trying to decipher through all of this and not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that when you put all those words up there, all those buzzwords and friendly words, and mm -hmm. you, know, you look at those, and I bet every single one of us can connect in one way or another to a whole bunch of those words. You know, like friends of the, well, some of us are friends of the library. Does that make us, you know, parties to Agenda 21? You know, I think that we just have to be able to help people distinguish between the bad stuff and, and the good stuff, and then maybe, like, for example, with regional uh, regional groups, like regional councils and things, you, know, you want to have your local officials participating in those because that's how we're going to protect our rights here in Lake County. And so we need to be maybe as stealth as they were as we try to dismantle some of the bad stuff mm -hmm. out of our local documents. Um, I just, it just seems to me that we need to be very smart about how we go about this. Uh, I, would, I would agree with you 100%, and um, we need to be careful. You know, when I first looked at some of the websites with Agenda 21, it just came across as very extreme. If we come across that way, we will lose credibility, and a lot of those people have in Tallahassee. I was at a, a meeting in Seminole County with uh, the county chairman and a couple of other people. They were discussing the whole issue of smart meters, no doubt you've heard all about that. But they were, they were talking about, and they had gone through some of the county uh, ordinances and stuff, and one of the ordinances that this one woman had found was an ordinance that said if you're going to remodel your home or sell it, and there's remodeling to be done, then you have to use, I can't remember the name of it, it was these water efficient toilets. Um, you know, if, if water efficient toilets are so great and so affordable, let it be out on the free market and let it be a choice to people. Don't, don't put it in an ordinance to say, I have to do it. Yeah. And, and that's, I would say that's, and that, that is really hard to find, but she had, this is a woman that had gone through the, the ordinances and had found that out and pointed it out to him. And um, that takes hard work. So I am not a researcher, but I was very impressed that she had done that. And I think at the local levels, that's, that's the kind of ways that we could help you is by looking at some of that stuff and researching that, and I, you know, because I agree. And as I said earlier, not everything in Agenda 21 is bad. There's nothing wrong with forward planning. The whole idea of regional councils came out of World War II, in fact. And it was a federal thing, and they gave money so that planning would be done for future growth and stuff. I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. But when we start to, you know, restrict everybody's private property rights and say you can and can't do this, that's where we need to be careful, and, and like these ordinances that can slip in that mandate certain things. You know, the the whole light bulb thing. You know, we can't be living with incandescent bulbs now. We all have to have fluorescent. You know, let that be a choice, but don't make me do it. This is a free market, and property rights in Europe. So, and I would just say to all of y'all, encourage commissioners. Like, like we have here because this is um, this is just tough stuff and, and how to say it and sound rational and not like we're going off the deep end. We really have to be careful with that. And Agenda 21 has been a 20 year increment by increment by increment by increment by increment mm -hmm. and before you know it you can get way out here on some of these things. So we, we have to reverse that process yes. to the same thing. Yes? Um, education. Yeah, education. Um, I wish that you could go to an assembly in a high school and have a program for every student there and tell them about Agenda 21 because it's the youth who doesn't know that. And I, don't take my degree from me, I've been fighting this for years. In the Constitution it says we have one right which is the property right to own property. It's been stated. So what are we fighting it for? It's just like gun control. What are we fighting it for? It's in the Constitution. Nobody follows the Constitution. Now I'm speaking about our leaders because of our well, school. Yeah. Well, if you find a school that would let me come in and do this, I'll be oh, glad to. I wish I could do this. Well, I mean, you, you can say it any other way. We're not trying to go crazy. We'll go here and ask. Just real quickly, the county um, comprehensive plan before Leslie was elected. 
Uh, I went through it just the other day and did a search on the word shall, which means that you have to do it. And there was over 4,000 hits where they put the word shall in there, which means that then somebody either has to ensure compliance or there could be lawsuits or other things like that. And that's what the issue is. You know, one of the things that we Not are many, trying to do with this club is to get more people going to your city council meetings and reporting back to us because I think there's a lot of things, you know, we the people, the government works best when it's, it's governing locally. Mm -hmm. And when you move it farther away from the people, then there are a lot of things happen away from the people. So I think that our local government, our city councils, our county commission, our school board, we need people to go there and just be the eyes and ears and to find out what is really happening at those meetings and what's being said and be a voice because they think that, you know, we've, we just think that everybody is being taken care of and probably we are to a certain degree, but there's, if you're not a voice, in these meetings, then we won't know what's really happening in those meetings. So I encourage you to always go to your local city council meetings and not just when the big issues are there, but just as often as you can get there. Any other questions? Um, you know, to some degree, everything in the world seems to be involved in this. The question was, are smart meters involved in this? I don't remember reading anything oh, in Agenda yeah. 21 that talked about smart meters. I think what people are concerned with that is that this will be a mechanism by which you and your living habits can be monitored and ultimately controlled. I don't know. That's not my fight. If it's yours, you can do that. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not fighting President Obama's birth certificate or smart meters or some of these other things. My, my focus is is with property and again you can aim in any direction you know agenda 21 is like this you know if agenda 21 was a cancerous tumor we could just put our finger on it and identify it and zap it wouldn't that be great yeah. but it's not it's more like a blood cancer it's everywhere in the system so if we zap if we zap too hard we just kill the whole thing off we can't do that we're not going to do that but it's how we go through and identify things and try to promote, you know, we don't want to be just negative. And this is the fight I have sometimes. I found out in my first two months or three months of being at the, with the Coalition of Property Rights, I can play defense and I can tell you what I don't like about society for the rest of my life. What I'm trying to work right now is to identify principles of good land public policy so we can say this is what we are for and this is what we are wanting. So, to just go in and say, don't do that, that doesn't really help an elected official. We need to be on the, on the other side of that and be offering something and then coming in and supporting that. So I would encourage all of you, you know, begin to think, that's hard. I'm, I've been chewing on this for about four months, pretty hard now, and it's hard to come up with positive principles that, that just always apply. But uh, that's, that's where we need to do it. If we're going to have you know, good government means good people and good public policy. So that's what we're fighting for. Yes. I just want to throw one more thing in, because I thought about that too. It's almost like what they wrote was almost like the Bible. It was like this new Bible of how, as a world, we should conduct ourselves in order to deal with all of the challenges that will be coming as the population increases. Well, that kind of sounds like a good idea, to think ahead and try to plan and all that. It's just all of the stuff that they put in there. We need to come up with our own version of, okay, if we're going to be good stewards, here are some guidelines that could be followed. A lot of the stuff that would be good as guidelines, um, but not as mandates. And I think there's a complete economic, financial component of all of this, just like you talked about energy, it's about transferring wealth, it's about creating winners and losers. And, um, but it just seems like if we could come up with our version of protect, it would almost be like Agenda 21, but with free market principles, with respect of property rights, you know, those types of things. That's and, a great idea. <laughs> yeah, and then see if we could get some of these colleges, if we could find someone that could teach these classes, and instead of it just being a degree in sustainable development, you actually have a class where you're, um, you're comparing and contrasting market principles, free market, that type of thing, property rights versus Agenda 21, mm -hmm. and create a dialogue about 
what is good versus what is bad, and how do we come up with the ideal scenario? And, and here, here's, here's where the battle for that would be fought. The, the idea of producing that would, would be a challenging one, but it, that could be done. Getting a college to, to, to allow it, I don't even yeah. think that would be too hard if you were willing to pay for it. The sustainable development has raised huge money, and they would pay the college to go in and teach those initial courses. That's how that would happen. If we could do that, I'm sure some colleges would... Uh, would go to your would, conservative colleges first and start the Yeah, training. exactly. But there, there'll have to be yeah. some money behind it, too. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the battle, we like to say. Um, I'm certain that Dan's going to be around for a few minutes after we, but um, I did want to mention one last thing. Our next month's uh, speaker is Peter Feeman, and he is our state committee 